Um, hello everyone, uh, and thank you for tuning in to today's public lecture. Uh, I'm Dr. Stephen Bradbury. I'm a senior lecturer in sport equality and diversity at Loughborough University. And today's lecture is entitled Leveling the Field, Identifying and Challenging Racialized Inequities in Men's Professional Football in England. Now the lecture um, will do the following things and in the following order. Uh, I want to begin by alluding to racialized inequities in the broader sports coaching context, the broader international sport coaching context, before discussing more specifically how such issues are played out in men's professional football in England. I then want to draw your attention to and offer some analysis of the range of new interventions designed to address these racialized inequities before drawing on research conducted by myself and Dominic Connery Code, formerly of Loughborough, now at Manchester Metropolitan University, which examined the implementation and effectiveness of the English Football League's voluntary code of coach recruitment. I'll then offer some concluding comments and general recommendations for stakeholders uh, before saying a few words about the potential future um, trajectory of, of research in this field. I'll speak for about 40 minutes or so, that's the plan, uh, and I understand there'll then be space for questions, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have at the end of the presentation. So, uh, here goes. Now, over the last 50 years or so, the higher echelons of elite men's uh, sport in the global north has become increasingly characterized by the racial, ethnic, and cultural diversity of its playing workforce. Now, whilst these patterns of diversity differ across different national and sporting contexts and have not encompassed all minoritized groups to the same extent, in some sports, such as basketball in the US, rugby union in New Zealand, the presence of elite level sport performers from minoritized backgrounds has become comparable to or exceeded national racial population demographics. However, during this period, there has been a limited throughput of minoritized groups into the senior coaching tiers of men's elite level sport and across a range of national contexts. And where such transitions have occurred, minoritized coaches remain disproportionately restricted to peripheral support positions, such as assistant or positional coach, youth development coach, or recruiters, often with lower levels of formal authority or decision-making powers. And where opportunities for upward career mobility remain limited, now, in a US context, these patterns, I think, are illustrated well by Cunningham in his secondary analysis of data collected by Lapchik at the Institute for Diversity and Ethics as part of their annual racial and gender scorecard of US sport. Now, I think usefully it provides us with a clear visual representation of the levels of players, assistant coaches, and head coaches from minoritized backgrounds and indicate some similar patterns across all of the sports under review. The representation of minoritized head coaches, lower than that of assistant coaches and lower still in comparison to players in almost every case. Now such patterns aren't restricted to the US. Recent research undertaken by Sporting Equals in the UK has also drawn attention to the low levels of minoritized coaches via its recently published race representation index and which monitors employment as senior coaches at NGBs, national governing bodies, in relation to national performance or development squads. In total, just 14% of NGBs employed minoritized coaches in senior coaching positions comparable to or above 
national population demographics, around 15%. And 86% of NGBs did not, including 50% who employed either none or less than 3% of minoritized coaches in senior positions of this kind. Now, a number of scholars have argued that representational disparities of this kind globally are underscored by a series of racialized barriers at the macro societal, the meso organizational and the micro individual level. So at the macro level, with respect to broader structural arrangements, constraints engendered by dominant political or legislative contexts, and the role of powerful stakeholders in the coach hiring process. At the meso level, in relation to the institutionalized practices and cultures, and the existence of racial bias within the senior decision making tiers of sport organizations. And at the micro level, in relation to the sometimes inequitable interactional spaces of sports coaching environments. Now, similar patterns of underrepresentation are identifiable at men's professional football clubs in England. So, for example, according to the LMA, the League Managers Association, between 1960 and 2018, 58 years, just 34 minoritized coaches have held head coach positions across all four divisions of English football inclusive of just seven coaches who'd held positions of this kind in the Premier League during that period. Now, research conducted by myself at Loughborough in conjunction with the Sports People's Think Tank and the FAIR Network indicated that between 2014 and 2017, the levels of minoritized coaches holding senior coaching positions at professional clubs remained stubbornly low at around 4% of the overall coaching workforce. The findings here are comparable to prior research undertaken again by myself in 2013, in which focused on elite clubs in seven countries in Western Europe, where just 2.3% of head coaches and 4.5% of assistant coaches were from minoritized backgrounds. Now, recent research by Conrad Code and myself identified higher levels of representation at club youth academies in England, around 17%, but found that minoritized coaches were much more likely to be employed in lower status, part-time and sessional coaching positions in such settings. Now, in recent years, a number of UK-based scholars have conducted qualitative research and drawn on the experiential testimonies of minoritized coaches and other stakeholders in the men's professional game in England to help identify the factors which underpin these residual representational trends. My own research on this score over a 10-year period between 2010 and 2020 has included interviews with excess of 100 minoritized coaches and stakeholders drawn from dominant and marginalized ethnicities. Broadly speaking, this research has alluded to the historical and continued existence of practices, experiences, and impacts of both access and treatment discrimination in men's professional football coaching contexts. Firstly, it's identified the existence of overt, but more often inferential racisms and racialized microaggressions in some elite level coach education and coach workplace environments. Such behaviors have been evidenced in the racially inequitable interactions reported to have taken place in such settings and include the use of inappropriate language and behaviors and the questioning of the social and technical competencies of minoritized coaches. And in ways which 
are rarely, if ever, extended to the review of white coaches. Such actions have afforded less professional value, less status, less credibility to minoritized coaches and engendered additional psychological pressures to build confidence, prove competence and negotiate some racially inequitable environments. Secondly, practices of racialized stereotyping and cultural othering and which have problematized minoritized coaches in different ways, but with comparable negative developmental and vocational outcomes. So for example, the repackaging of old stereotypes about black players as natural athletes, but lacking the requisite cerebral skill sets or self-discipline for leadership. Such stereotypes have over time become transferred into the coaching sphere and have framed black coaches as lacking the intellectual, analytical and organizational acumen and to have limited suitability or competence or authority to coach and manage teams at the elite level. Now these stereotypical tropes have created a narrative of uncertainty and risk around black coaches, framed them as fit for playing but not fit for organizing sport. And has arguably underpinned the racialized assessments of minoritized coaches by some white coach educators and senior decision makers at professional clubs, such as CEOs or club owners, who have adversely conceptualized black and other minoritized coaches in terms of a series of falsely assumed racial, ethnic and cultural traits, rather than in relation to their evidential, technical and experiential skill sets by their assumed racial self, rather than their actual professional self. Put another way, a minoritized coach is always viewed as a minoritized coach, whereas a white coach is viewed simply as a coach. And thirdly here, we've drawn attention to some unshifting practices of institutional closure evident in the continued reliance on networks-based rather than qualifications-based mechanisms of coach recruitment at clubs. Now these commonly practiced headhunting approaches are exercised by key power brokers such as club owners, CEOs and senior operations and senior coaching staff and have traditionally tended to favor known white coaches drawn from within the dominant white social and cultural networks of the football industry and have militated against minoritized coaches with fewer longstanding or substantive ties to this informally established occupational marketplace. Now, my own research in this field has drawn attention to the ways in access to such networks is enabled or constrained over the football career life course. And in relation to such issues as prior playing experience, racialized power imbalances within team dynamics, and what I've referred to as captain to coach pathways. Now in the latter case, in relation to the historical tendency of head coaches to confer captaincy duties on centrally positioned white players. Now this is arguably limited on pitch opportunities for minoritized players to formally exhibit leadership skills and competencies considered by power brokers to be strong indicators of future elite level coaching potential. And limited to those off pitch opportunities for extended levels of contact and networking with the inner circle of white power brokers at clubs and other areas of the game. And so limited opportunities really to enhance profile, visibility, favorability in relation to coaching appointments. Now recent uh, research has, has echoed and extended these UK-based findings 
and has drawn attention to the existence of racism and stereotypes and networks um, in football coaching in France, the Netherlands and Belgium. Countries like England, where there has been a limited transition from playing to coaching amongst minoritized groups. Now, for critical race theory scholars like myself, Hilton, Kilvington, the continued existence of racism and stereotypes and networks is underscored by the normative and, and largely unremarked power of whiteness embedded within the senior decision-making tiers of the game, which has allowed racialized inequities to be effortlessly perpetuated and reinforced. And for the dominant white structures and cultures which underpin them to remain unchanged. Now, as a result, it's been argued by myself and others that any measures to address racialized inequities of this kind should seek to challenge and disrupt and dismantle the routinized practices and normative arrangements of coach recruitment. Now, as to some of these emerging measures in this field and the extent to which they have done so or have not done so, as the case may be, to which I'd like to now turn. Now, over the last 10 years or so, a number of stakeholder bodies in professional football in England have gradually responded to external pressures from equality campaigns, media sources, high profile minoritized coaches and academics to develop some new interventions to address racialized inequities in coaching. Now, for the most part, these interventions have utilized positive actions as enabled by section 158 and 159 of the 2010 UK Equality Act. Broadly speaking, positive actions are targeted measures designed to support social groups who have experienced historical disadvantage in a given field. Now in sport, the use of positive actions are encouraged in principle in the advanced levels of the UK Sport Council's Equality and Sport Framework and in the EDI action plans of some UK NGBs, including the FA. Now, for the most part, interventions in football coaching have utilised what we might term softer positive actions and have featured a focus on training and development in particular through the provision of financial and mentoring support to enable minoritized coaches to achieve high level coaching qualifications and engage in experiential learning at clubs. So for example, the FA Coach Inclusion and Diversity Programme has since 2016 supported up to 100 minoritized coaches per annum to achieve FA UA for B coaching awards. And at one time, around 20 minoritized coaches per annum to achieve FA UA for A and FA UA for advanced youth awards. The FA, in conjunction with the EPL and EFL, has, since 2019, established a related club placement program to enable minoritized coaches to gain season long experience of working at club academies, albeit on a voluntary basis. Similarly, at the national level, the FA since 2018 has established year long placement opportunities for up to 15 elite level minoritized coaches at age specific national team training camps. And in 2020, the EPL in conjunction with the EFL and PFA launched the Professional Player to Coach Scheme, a two-year salary, a two-year salaried internship at uh, clubs for six minoritized coaches. More broadly, 
the EPL's Elite Coach Apprenticeship Scheme, ECAS, supports coaches to complete the FAUA for pro license and ensures that at least 20% of participants are from what it terms marginalized backgrounds, including minoritized coaches and women. And there are additional learning opportunities that have been provided throughout this period by the LMA and the PFA with respect to master classes, coaching clinics, and interview preparation support for minoritized coaches. Now, while some of these interventions are at a, a relatively formative stage of their implementation, I would argue that the apparent lack of any independence and or any transparent mechanisms for measuring or reporting publicly on their progress renders their effectiveness difficult to assess. However, where independent evaluation has taken place, it's indicated some mixed outcomes. So for example, my own official evaluation supported by the FA of the FA Coach Diversity and Inclusion Programme indicated some initial success in unblocking the early educational phase of the pipeline of progression into elite coaching and in engendering developmental benefits, a whole series of key developmental benefits for those minoritized coaches who took part. However, there is little evidence to suggest that this and other interventions that I've referred to have enabled trans positions into paid employment at clubs to any extent. So we might conclude that whilst the use of soft positive actions has had some success in levelling up competencies and experiences, it's offered only a partial and conceptually limited response to addressing underrepresentation as paid coaches, in particular by operating a, operating a single level individualized, deficit-based approach to addressing racialized inequities and encouraging the incorporation of minoritized coaches into existing football structures, rather than seeking to reform the institutional practices and cultures which underpin and perpetuate the racialized status quo within these environments. In contrast, other interventions have sought to utilize harder positive actions of particular or, or with particular respect to coach recruitment. Now interventions of this kind have sought to utilize, uh, sorry, interventions of this kind have been informed by the Rooney Rule, which was first implemented as a, a strongly regulated approach to head coach recruitment in the US National Football League in 2003 and which has since been expanded to incorporate other senior operations positions at NFL clubs. Now the Rooney Rule, boiled down to its most basic level, operates a form of inclusive shortlisting. It stipulates that at least one person of color is interviewed for all positions of this kind at NFL clubs, and includes significant financial penalties for clubs in breach of these regulations. Now in 2018, the bespoke version of the Rooney Rule was adopted in principle by the FA in relation to the recruitment of coaches at age-specific national teams. But two years prior to that, at the beginning of the 2016-17 season, the EFL launched two parallel codes of coach recruitment relevant to its member clubs. The mandatory code of coach recruitment in relation to club youth academies and the voluntary code of coach recruitment in relation to first team operations. Now the voluntary code began first as a pilot scheme at 10 clubs and was later rolled out in 2017 to encompass all 72 EFL clubs. In 2019, the voluntary code was repackaged and rebranded by the EFL as a mandatory code. But just how mandatory a code it is in its present caveat laden wording remains open to question. Now it reads as follows, and I've put the 
precise regulations of the mandatory code on the slide taken directly from, from the EFL's uh, club regulations. It says, where a club seeking to employ a manager, brackets head coach, operates a recruitment process, which for the purposes of this regulation involves any process of shortlisting candidates and the interviewing of more than one candidate, and an application is received from any minority candidate, the club shall invite one or more minority candidates to, to interview for the role of manager. Now, the devil is always in the detail. So any reading of, of that code would reveal this. The code only applies if the club decides to operate a recruitment process. And then only if during that process, the club decides to interview more than one candidate. Further, compliance with the regulation only extends to reporting whether or not the club decided to follow the principles of the code or not. Now, it seems to me that any of us that, who possess a dictionary will understand this code as it is written as voluntary, not mandatory. It's only mandatory for a club to follow the code if it voluntarily decides to do so, which makes it a voluntary code, not a mandatory one, regardless of how it's branded. So in this respect, despite some surface level similarities, the code differs markedly from the Rooney Rule by virtue of its more limited operational scope and its apparent lack of independent monitoring or enforcement of sanctions for non-compliance. And so the code can be understood less as a legally binding consideration forcing mechanism, such as the Rooney Rule, and more as a form of reflexive self-regulation, where the intention is to act as a stimulus form, rather than a regulatory mechanism to enforce a more equitable approach to coach recruitment at EFL clubs. but what of its implementation and effectiveness in practice? Well, research undertaken by uh, Conrad Code and myself has sought to evaluate this via two separate but overlapping studies, in which included extensive documentary analysis and semi-structured interviews with 45 research participants, including CEOs at clubs, stakeholder representatives, and minoritized coaches with experience of working within the professional game. Now, our findings indicated that at an operational level, in terms of its implementation, uh, at an operational level, the principles and the guidance embodied in the code had largely been ignored. We found no evidence that it had ever been implemented by clubs. Instead, interviewees referred to the continued operation of informal and unregulated approaches to recruitment based on identification and information gathering, almost exclusively undertaken within the private conversational spaces of the dominant white networks of the football industry. And this was especially the case during periods of in-season crisis management a period in which 70% of all head coach sackings and, and new appointments are made. And often in response to external pressures to appoint staff with immediacy. Now, our findings uh, also indicated a strong preference among CEOs to exercise operational autonomy in appointing coaches and without any external regulation. So CEOs in our study considered the code to be antithetical to the competitive process of coach recruitment and to constitute an unwanted and optional rather than valued and fundamental principle of recruitment at clubs. From a critical race theory perspective, this particular standpoint was underscored 
by an adherence to dominant liberal notions of meritocracy, race neutrality, and colorblindness on the part of decision makers at clubs, and which remain a normative feature of the football landscape in England. Such perceptions downplay the existence of racialized inequities and present club coaching as a, a kind of deracialized, egalitarian space. CEO's responses also, we found, drew on Bonilla Silva's conceptual frame of abstract liberalism to suggest that existing practices are somehow fair and unbiased, and that the redistributive principles of the code constitute a form of racial favoritism. And these perspectives were used by CEOs to legitimize their resistance to a directive, problematic as it is, designed to open up recruitment and diversify the coaching workforce. In terms of effectiveness, accordingly, there was a strong consensus uh, that the code had largely been ineffective, that it, would, that it had limited any opportunities for minoritized coaches to progress through the applications to interview stage and therefore to have disabled any opportunity to showcase their technical and experiential skill set in these interactional spaces. Further, levels of minoritized coach representation at clubs have remained consistently low at around 4%, with no identifiable upturn. And on this score, Interviewees, uh, people who we spoke to, referred to the continued recruitment of known white coaches from within the merry-go-round of the football coaching marketplace. And as a result, patterns of what Cunningham refers to as homologous reproduction were exacerbated. Exacerbated further by the unregulated freedoms afforded to head coaches themselves to recruit trusted coach support teams with similar white norms and behaviours. Our findings here chime strongly with the work of scholars who have alluded to the disjuncture between the high profile institutional commitments of national sport bodies around equity and inclusion and the lack of action in reality. And this seems especially the case in relation to the code's intention to engender internal change at clubs, but where its lack of application has rendered it a largely gestural, non-performing substitute for action. And findings here are also reflective, I think, of the limited effectiveness of racial equality policies in UK sport more broadly, which have sought to amend organisational processes, but leave the structures and the cultures which underpin them untouched. And finally here, a number of mainly stakeholder and, and minoritized coach of in, interviewees reflected on how the code might be reformulated, how it might be re-implemented to better meet its intended impacts. Firstly, they said that it should involve a more strongly consultative process and that that should be undertaken by the EFL and clubs in collaboration with other football bodies and especially minoritized coaches. This was felt to help likely circumvent some organizational power imbalances and promote deliberative democracy in policy development. They also felt that the code should be much more tightly worded than its present caveat laden incarnation and that it should feature a mandatory formalized obligation for all clubs to operate a full recruitment process for all first team coaching positions in all circumstances and at all times. This was felt to bring the code closer in line to the NFL's Rooney Rule, which mandates rather than just suggests that the club should operate inclusive shortlisting. And finally, interviewees felt that a new mandatory code should feature a more robust and transparent process of monitoring and enforcement and feature financial sanctions for clubs. Taken together, 
our findings here, I think, chime with the work of other critical scholars working in this field. And certainly square firmly with the broader claims of, of critical race theorists that liberalism alone is not enough to address embedded forms of institutional racism. And that a much more strongly interventionist, redistributive and transformational approach is needed to challenge and disrupt and reconfigure the white structures, cultures and practices which have created and sustained the racialized status quo. Now, in this penultimate slide, I just want to, to offer some brief conclusions and some general recommendations to stakeholders. Now, the, the central thrust of, of this lecture has been that racialized inequities in sport and in football coaching contexts continue to exist. And that the racialized barriers that underpin them are multi-leveled and multi-dimensional. And that responses in football have lacked whole game coordination and have been characterized by single level interventions, which aim to develop minoritized coaches while simultaneously failing to address the structural and institutional informants of their ongoing marginalization. In particular, the lack of open, transparent and equitable processes of recruitment at clubs. So in order to address this, I suggest here four broad areas for consideration. In the first instance, football stakeholder bodies should work much more collaboratively and with minoritized coaches to develop a more coordinated, a more holistic, a more multi-leveled approach to address racialized inequities in football coaching. If racialized barriers are multi-leveled, then so too should be the measures to address them. In doing so, football bodies should develop and implement robust policy interventions, which include clear policy goals, the collection of baseline data, target setting and monitoring against clearly defined timescales. Now, on this latter score, the FA's new leadership diversity code offers a space for some cautious optimism in its efforts to set and monitor progress against targets for both racial and gender diversity in coaching and leadership in club football. However, is likely to, to experience the same limitations as other voluntary measures in that clubs remain under no legal compunction to collect such data or comply with the guidance set out in the code. So it's a process that encourages good practice, but based only on goodwill. And that only takes you so far. So interventions such as the FA's Leadership Diversity Code and the EFL Codes of Coach Recruitment, I would argue, should be much more strongly interventionist, more transformational in their policy intentions and ideological scope. Should utilize strongly regulated and reformatory positive actions to forcefully stimulate the conditions under which equality of opportunities, experiences, and importantly, outcomes can be better realized. And thirdly, here, football bodies should work, I think, with sport and equality bodies more broadly to develop and implement education and training programs. Now, in the first instance, such programs should target key stakeholders in football, such as club owners, senior executives, operational staff, and within the media. That is, those with powers of appointment, or at least powers to influence appointment in football coaching. Now, pedagogical efforts of this kind should pay particular attention to outlining the ways in which institutionalized operational practices and unconscious racial bias can impact in constraining the career progression of minoritized coaches. And importantly, 
should do more to contextualize the relevance and applicability of legislative measures, such as the codes of recruitment. These measures are more likely to be effective if those with responsibility for their implementation understand them and develop a stronger ideological and attitudinal buy-in to them. In the second instance here, in terms of education and training, I think the continuation and further development of some of those programmes designed to develop and empower minoritised coaches with requisite vocational and experiential skill sets. Now, I referred to them earlier in this lecture in, in a fairly disparaging way, or it may have come across that way that, that they are, are referred to them as a kind of indi individualised deficit-based approach. Now, to qualify that, I think such programmes, when delivered in isolation, can contribute only to enhanced employability, but in a closed marketplace. Such programmes, when delivered and connected to a more holistic programme of robust policy interventions, I would suggest are more likely to contribute not just to enhanced employability, but the realisation of employment and in a more open, transparent and equitable marketplace. And finally here, uh, and relatedly, I think more needs to be done to enhance the social capital of minoritized coaches. And with respect to opportunities for physical and virtual networking and mentoring and advocacy from senior coaches drawn from a range of ethnicities. And I think more can be done here by white coaches, white senior coaches in terms of providing allyship and championing racial diversity. And also to establish the, the long discussed, but to my knowledge, and I'm happy to stand corrected on this, the never realized national database or ready list of highly qualified minoritized coaches against which football clubs could identify potential applicants. And finally here, I would just say that, that within these broad recommendations, I think there's a huge space to develop more specific, more bespoke, contextually relevant interventions and activities, but that the application of these broader recommendations is likely to engender a more operationally equitable and more culturally reflexive approach to coach recruitment and therefore more likely to lead to meaningful change rather than more of the same. Now, my final comments here, and I'll be as brief as, as I can, is that I just want to draw your attention to some potential and ongoing areas of future research. So what should, where should research go in this field? Well, I think a great deal, whilst a great deal of research has been undertaken in mapping the representation and racialized barriers in men's professional football, more research is needed in that area in terms of coaching at both first team and academy level, and to encompass a broader range of coaching and support roles than has been examined before, and to extend that research to encompass senior management and operation roles, and at board level, where many of the decisions that impact on coach recruitment are made. Secondly, I think much more research needs to be done to evaluate the effectiveness of interventions. Beyond my own evaluation of the Coach Inclusion and Diversity Programme and, and my joint evaluation or, or analysis of the codes of coach recruitment, the extent to which other interventions have been effective remains unknown. What do such interventions involve in practice? How are they experienced by those who take part in them? To what extent have they been beneficial and in what ways and for whom? Such research might illuminate best practice and enable it to be shared more widely. Thirdly here, research of both the first and second kind should also be extended to the women's game, where the professional playing, coaching and leadership landscape seems to me to be overwhelmingly white and where the intersectional experiences of minoritized women need to be documented, 
illuminated and prioritized in football and in sport more broadly. Now on this score, uh, just a few weeks ago, Zulika Sheik began a new PhD study under my supervision at Loughborough with a view to examining the experiences of minoritized women in football leadership with particular respect to looking at the ways in which targeted leadership programs can enhance employability and social capital amongst this group. We expect that this will be a highly original research project and is likely to lead to some insightful and far reaching findings. And my last comment here is really that in the UK at least, whilst much of the research has focused on football, an examination of the representation and experiences of minoritized coaches in other sports is notable by its absence. On this score, Ross Enzor, a now second year PhD student at Loughborough, and again under my supervision, is now in the process of conducting research of this kind in cricket, in rugby union, and in basketball. And in what we hope will be an interesting and informative study, in which amongst other things, we'll examine the potential and realized benefits of establishing a racially diverse coaching workforce. And finally here, I've just included a list of my, uh, some references from my own work in this area, scholarly work, uh, all or most of which can be accessed by the university institutional repository. And I've put the link at the top of the page. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope I didn't go on too long, but knowing myself, I probably did. Uh, I hope you found it informative. Uh, and I think we have some time for questions.